Amen. Good morning, church. We're going to ask everybody who's uh, able to please stand with us as we worship this morning, God. Uh, this uh, first song we're going to do says, Open up the heavens. Let that be our prayer. We just want to see God meet us here in this place. Day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. to the altar and um, there are times in our lives where disappointments come people let us down and discouragements come um, this week Alex and I have had one of the best weeks we've had in a long time and also one of the worst weeks but even in the midst of all that all the things um, we've been praying about a job and Alex was blessed with the job this week so amen, we praise the Lord for that. And the first day that he was signed up to go to this new job, our car broke down on us. And at first I was angry, like, Lord, you blessed us. How can you take our blessings away? And then I got to thinking, the enemy of our lives never wants to see us walking in God's blessings or in his favors. There are some of you out there in the 
congregation this morning that came in with a disappointment. You came in with the weight of your sin on your shoulder. Some of you may have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And this song is all about Jesus is calling. He's not calling us to be perfect, but he calls us in the middle of our mess. He calls us in the middle of our disappointments. So this morning, I want you to just surrender your hearts.
feel uh, led just to lead us in a quick, quick prayer. I hope that's okay. Let's go ahead and, and bow. God, we just uh, we want to thank you for uh, leading us to your house this morning, God. I pray, um, Lord, if there's any disunity right now, I pray that you would just um, allow us to rebuke that in the name of Jesus, God. That is not of you. And uh, Lord, I, I just want your spirit to flow through this place, God. I, I want us just to get lost in worship, God. And it's nothing that we're doing up here on the stage. It's nothing, um, as we as we sing out, it's nothing we're doing, but it's everything you've done for us, God. You've done so much, Lord, coming down here and dying for us and saving us of our sins, God. And, and not only that, but you continue to bless us every single day of our lives, God. I pray that right now, any distractions, God, maybe we had a terrible week. Maybe things at work were just terrible. Maybe things at home have just been so hard right now, God. Uh, I just feel like maybe there's there's some distractions going on. God, get that away right now, please, Lord. I ask you in the name of Jesus to get that away. Lord, we just um, we want to come back to a place of worship, God, where it's all about you. Lord, lead us, uh, help us to um, just to focus on you. And I pray for uh, my dad's message later. Lord, please speak to us and and draw us closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You are good, you are good when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You thank you for that. You are peace. Peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, and you death has lost its sting. Thank you, Lord.
this time, we'll have our time of fellowship. We encourage you to tell people good morning. Maybe tell them your plans for the Super Bowl tonight. Good morning, and welcome to Freedom Church. And I want to personally say thank you for allowing us to share uh, some of this uh, Super Bowl Sunday time with you. But before the game starts, it's going to be super in here. Can I get an amen? I want everybody, uh, I want everyone just right now, stop what you're doing. I want you to take your right hand. I want you to put it over your heart right now. You should be able to feel a good, strong beat. And maybe, maybe this morning some people's hearts are fluttering a little bit because uh, maybe you've got some anxiety. Maybe you're nervous over something. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have some big decisions in your life. Maybe, maybe your heart's beating good and strong. You've made good, sound decisions, and maybe you're excited for today. Maybe you're, maybe you're excited about being here at Freedom Church and wanting God to speak to you. And maybe other people, maybe some people, it's like, man, my heart's not right with God right now. I've, I've got a lot of things uh, that have really distracted my vision from God. And so we ask ourselves the question, this is it? This is, I mean, we are told the culture, the worldly culture in our life tells us to get all that we can and spend all we can. And yet that philosophy leaves people so void and so empty. Jesus even said it. What would it profit a person if they gained the whole world but still yet lose their soul? That's emptiness. And there's so much more to this life. But we must live life from the heart. We're going to be talking about that this whole month about heartbeats. It's living from the heart. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about four areas that our heart should beat for. And let, let me say this before we start even get into the text. Folks, I want to be open. I want to be very sincere. I want us to put in a, a godly attitude. If our heart is beating for anything other than what God wants us to have, we've got wrong desires. And let me just be honest. Only trouble and heartache will be later on down the road. So this is what we want to lay a great foundation. Uh, if, if John is able to, if John's schedule permits... John Fry will be preaching next Sunday, and uh, I'm just telling you, you guys do not want to miss. You do not want to miss, and if it's possible, bring someone with you on the week of the 20th and the, and the 21st, because that's going to be a phenomenal personal message for everyone here. But um, today, we're going to cover four areas that our heart should beat for. Let's take a look in Psalm. 27, Psalm 27, verse 4. Psalm 27, verse 4. The one thing I ask of the Lord. Everybody say one thing. The thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Now, how many people, by saying amen, would say that is an awesome, incredible Aspiration to live for life. So whoever wins. My one desire. The thing I seek most. It's in my heart. Is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Delighting in the Lord's perfections. And meditating. In his temple. Let's pray. Heavenly Father we're so thankful to come. To this holy solemn place. This place that you gave to us, your house. And let your house be known as a house of prayer. And Lord, our hearts and our minds and our lips, our, our praise and our prayer goes up to you. And we ask, Lord, right here, that you start a revolution. Let that revolution start today in us, that our hearts would beat strong for the other things in life that you want us to pursue. To pursue the things that you lay out for us, God. And that we know that are, that are healthy and wholesome for us. So be with us today. God, I pray that you enable me to preach these words with courage and with boldness. And Lord, I pray that we would receive it. 
we would receive this truth and act upon it. We ask in Jesus' name, and the church said, what makes your heart flutter? Is it you get excited when you know you get to spend a holiday with the family? Does your heart flutter when you see the American flag wave and you hear the star-spangled banner being played? Does your heart flutter when you see children at play? When, when you see children just laughing and it's, it's so pure and it's just so innocent? Does your heart flutter when you, when you see a special person? Or does your heart get pumping when you hear a, when you hear a, a good uh, energetic song? Are there songs that just make your heart putter? Well, unfortunately, some people have uh, a heartbeat for wrong things in life. Sometimes people have the desire that their heart beats to elevate themselves. Or their heart beats to be absorbed in money, riches, fame. Maybe their heart beats to be absorbed in pleasure or relaxation. Or in self-recognition. And the, score, the, the Bible tells us in the book of Acts. Talks about two individuals. Who God saw the wickedness of their heart. Because they wanted all the recognition. The Bible talks about Ananias and Sapphira. And how that they was consumed with it. That was what their heart beat for. But this morning we want to speak on four areas. That our heart should be passionate and that our heart should beat for. Point number one. Our heart should beat for a productive work. Our heart should beat for a productive work. Our heart should beat to be productive simply for no other reason, because God created us to work. Now, I know some people might think that work is a bad name. Uh, some people might say, you know, uh, I don't like to work. Then you need to find another line of work if you don't like your, your work. Um, because there's so much more to life than just, I've, I've had people tell me, Dwayne, um, I can't stand my job, but I'm making good money and I've got great benefits. If you can't stand a job, that's a long time to have to work somewhere for a place that you don't like or a boss that you don't like. Uh, life is filled with a lot of choices. You can make yourself happier because when you're not happy, you're making other people unhappy. Can I get an amen? But we should desire to work for no other reason because God created us to work. When God created Adam and placed him in the Garden of Eden, he said his job was to till the ground, to take care of, of plants. And, boy, that, that is a relaxing work. And, man, you just, you, you just feel like you're, you're doing so much. But our heart should desire to beat for a productive work. You, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you should have a heartbeat. You should have a pulse to see God's kingdom grow. You should have that. That should be a part of your DNA. Did you know that the Bible says that works are so important that the Bible declares in the New Testament, faith without works is dead. We should have a heart that beats for a productive work. There are four reasons, or there's actually four things that work will do for us. And this is how God has designed it. Number one. Work will provide. It helps us earn money. So we can pay the bills. We can keep the electric on. We can keep the water running. We can make the house payment. We can pay for the vehicles. We can keep food on the table. We can keep clothes on our children. But work helps us. To provide. And that's that's important. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the most basic New, Te New Testament concepts that was built upon the principle of work is the Apostle Paul says, if a person doesn't work, neither should they eat. That's that's how that works. 
And so we should, parents, grandparents, we should instill a solid work ethic in all of our people and all the people that we come in contact with. The second thing that work will do for us is it makes us productive. We should all want to be productive. We should want to be able to see at the end of the day the investment in our time that makes us productive. How many people really cannot stand not being productive? Man, that is one of my pet peeves. One of the things that drives me bonkers is when I go in, I kind of have my day uh, kind of all set, have it all organized, and I always have bills to pay. I've got schedules to make. I've got people to contact, and I kind of have my game plan, and I just feel so non-productive as something happens, and it pulls me away from that. Even though I have been productive, it just makes me feel like I didn't get a lot of stuff done that I wanted to do. And it makes it really difficult. God wants you to work so you can be productive. Have you ever met somebody who was constantly in trouble? Can I tell you the number one reason why? It's because they don't have anything to do. If you look at our youth today, their youth are troubled simply not because there's things to get into. It's simply because they don't have the right things to get into. My grandma used to say all the time, idle hands are the devil's playhouse. You're not productive. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs chapter 6, you want to read the six things that God hates. And the seventh is an abomination to him. It is a hor horrific investment of time in being non-productive. And God wants us to be productive for the right things. He has created inside of everyone's DNA is a desire to work to be productive. It's that when, when that's not activated and when they don't ha see it modeled in front of them, that causes people to be non-productive. And shame on this country that rewards people for being non-productive. The third thing that work does for us it, it helps us to make progress. Did you know that God wants to work on you? Let, let, let me say that again because I didn't get any, any amens. Did you know that God wants to work on you? Did you know that the Bible declares that God is the potter and we are the clay? God wants to work something in your life. I cannot stress, I cannot overemphasize enough the fact that right now, right at this very moment, God is working on us. God is bringing transformation. Man, last Sunday was such an incredible soaking of God's presence. And God is doing a work. And let us continue to allow Him to continue to keep doing that in our lives. To continue to bring transformation and growth, and wisdom, so we can continue to make progress. I think it is exciting. I love to see construction. And sometimes, have you ever drove by and you see that, you know, that, that they've leveled off some dirt, and maybe they've laid a, a concrete foundation, maybe they're laying some block, and you don't know what it is, you, you don't know what it's going to be, because there's no signs out there, but you know that something is in progress. I love progress, and God loves progress. And work gives us progress. The fourth thing that work will do for us is it gives us promotion. Gives us promotion. We're, we are promoted to do great things, and we can promote. Particularly, we are promoting. When you work in the church, you are promoting the church. When you work at your home, you're promoting your home. When you work in your relationships, you're promoting those relationships. Listen to this scripture, folks. Listen to this scripture. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. Nehemiah has been given a, a, a heart. He's been given passion about rebuilding, reconstructing the walls of Jerusalem. 
These walls have suffered horrific loss and damage. The walls have been torn down. The gates have been burned with fire. The people are in complete desolation and disarray. They, ha they have lack of leadership. So Nehemiah has this in his heart, and he shares this burden with um, the leaders in Israel. He shares this with the leaders there in Babylon with the, with the king. And everything starts to fall into place. He has, he has all the resources. But what good would resources be if you didn't have heart? What would all the people behind to say, we will do this, but if they didn't have heart, what good would it do? But I want you to notice what, what an uncommon people can do an uncommon task if they have heart. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6, it says, At last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. Now let me remind you, not a single one of these people know anything about construction. And they got to the point where they were working, but they had to have people with spears to watch over the work. When God sees the heart of people, God can take the untrained to do the unthinkable because God is God. And notice it said that the height around the entire city for the people had worked with enthusiasm. They had worked with their heart. Just, just a reminder, I know you guys are familiar with the story, but did you know that Nehemiah rebuilt the walls and hung up the gates in 52 days? That is amazing. And why were they able to do that? Because the people had heart. And we also, our heart should beat for productive work. Point number two this morning, our heart should beat to provide assistance. Let me throw in a plug. Our heart should be quick to jump in where we are needed. And I want to just throw in a real quick um, reminder to you guys. Next Sunday, 5 o'clock, this, this is a great cause. Jessie is wanting to go to a third world country, Guatemala. And she's wanting to do missionary work down, down in that country. And we have a great opportunity to jump on board. And there's, there's no set price. It's just whatever that you want to donate. Just make sure that you RSVP with Jesse. And so whatever that you want to donate. And that will help her to get launched for that. We should have a heart that wants to provide assistance. If there's something that is so small that can make such a big difference is when you provide assistance. Folks, can I tell you one thing that just drives me crazy? It, I, I never tolerated it in my leadership when I was in the Air Force, and I will not tolerate it now. Being a supervisor at Green Memorial Hospital, I can't stand for somebody to look at me and say, that's not my job. You're not going to be working for me very long. If I tell you to go and do something and you say, that's not my job, you'll be finding another job. Can I get an amen on that? And so for 2016, if God pricks your heart to go and do something, you don't need my permission. Just, just say, Dwayne, God has laid on my heart about this, and I, I want to st I'll, I'll grab you by the arm, and we will step out in faith, and we will try to do that. But nothing means so much, it can be so small, but means so huge to someone when we have a heart that beats to provide for assistance. Deuteronomy chapter 15 verse 7. Listen to this. But if there are any poor Israelites in your towns. When you arrive in the land. And the Lord your God is giving you. Do not be hard hearted. Do not be hard hearted. We're talking about a heart that beats. We're talking about a heart that pulsates. That should be strong. Wants to provide assistance. Do not be hard hearted. Or tight fisted. Toward them. Instead be generous. And lead them. And lend them whatever they need. I'm going to give you three signs. Three completely healthy signs. Of a New Testament church. I want you guys to write these down. There are three signs. 
of a strong, heart-beating New Testament church. The first sign is the people are good. The people listen to the Lord, and they are good, or they're trying to be good. They're, they're doing their best to be good. Secondly, they are gracious. They are gracious people. We're going to get into that. And the third sign of a great, strong, healthy heart church is they are generous. So they're good, they're gracious, and they're generous. And we, when we talk about providing assistance, we're talking about those three elements. This morning, allow me to share some ways that we can provide assistance. Number one, seek opportunity. I want to ask you a question. Are you taking advantage of opportunities? Doors have opened up. And other people have tried to encourage you maybe to, maybe to jump through those doors or to jump through those opportunities. Maybe, maybe you're just not doing that. Or you see opportunities, you see the opportunities, and you think, yeah, God, that, that's pretty awesome. I'll wait and I'll do that some other time. And then your heart doesn't beat as strong. The Bible tells us one of the most beautiful painted pictures of someone who took advantage of opportunities. And his name was Boaz. And the Bible, I, I love it. It says Boaz left, left handfuls on purpose. Who is God giving you the opportunity to sow in somebody's life? To make a difference. And you may not think that they're paying attention. You may not think that you're doing any good at all. But because it is God's word and it is God's work, I would encourage you to seek opportunity. And you listen, I don't want anybody leaving here this morning thinking that there's not opportunity to be involved here at Freedom Church. I would encourage you to say, you know what, why, can I help be a greeter maybe on Saturday nights? Can I help maybe with band ministry to help keep the kids in line? Well, Steve is, uh, is, is driving the kids. Or maybe I can help share the load and do something in children's church. I, I'm, I'm seeking opportunity. Look at the community board. Read your bulletins. There are opportunities that abound everywhere. So do not be afraid to seek and to pray for those opportunities. The second way that we can do this is simply be gracious. And I'm not talking about just superficial grace. I'm talking about deep grace. Folks, I'm going to tell you right here, right now. If you want to see God's favor being poured out on you, you need to do these two things. You cannot substitute. You need to be generous and you need to be gracious. Be gracious. Grace means you're going to do something for someone you know that they're not going to be able to pay you back. That's, that, that's the official biblical definition of grace, what Christ done for us. Christ wants us to be gracious to others that we come in contact with as well. You will not find a more a more gracious deed that was done on a human being within the Old Testament than what you find. There's this period of history where Israel was living in a very dark and a very, very scattered time in history. And there was a, there was a, there was a woman who had another mother, had another, uh, child in her arm and bad news had come and so she's running with fear she's she's running and she's thinking that she's doing something good for this child but but she trips she falls and she breaks both of the child's legs now had that happened in modern day here in america 
we would say that there was no big thing to it. They could just go in and surgically repair it. But back in, back in those days, they did not have modern-day medicine, and they certainly didn't know how to fixate broken bones. This individual grew, had to grow up the rest of his life, disfigured, deformed, never being able to walk. And when King David, a gracious man, a man who learned how to seek God's favor by being gracious, said, is there anyone within the whole kingdom that I can bestow favor to? And someone remembered this crippled guy, and they told the king, they said, oh, king, there is a cripple who lives in Lodabar. He says, I want you to bring him to me. Such a, a beautiful picture that's painted when they bring in Mephibosheth to the king. He thinks that he's going to be killed because he has no value. He's not able to work. He's not able to pay taxes. He's not able to be in a standing army. There is nothing he can do. And so they brings them before the king and the king's palace and the king's throne room. And Mephibosheth is scared to death. He's afraid to look at the king. He's afraid that he's going to die. And he says, why have you called such a dog as me? He said, Mephibosheth, lift up your head. For as of today, forever until the day you die, you're going to sit and eat at the king's table and eat the king's food. Can I get a whoop whoop? That's good stuff. Talk about a Super Bowl party. You're getting to eat the king's food. Yeah, that's good stuff. That's not being nice, folks. That's being gracious. You see, being nice is sharing a couple of Burger King fries. Being gracious is giving the whole bag. Being nice is giving a couple of Oreo balls. That's just being nice. Being gracious is giving them all away. And what are you going to do with it anyway? Are you being gracious with your smile? Are you being gracious with your love? Are you being gracious with your time? The third thing that we can do is encourage and persuade. Our heart should be to provide assistance. Today, do you know somebody who just needs a little bit of encouragement? Today, do you know somebody who just needs a little gentle persuasion? Listen to what the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15, verse 2. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. We should help others do what is right and help build them up in the Lord. God has given everybody. Th these are all natural components that your heart are from the day that you are born god has already placed these heartbeats the natural heartbeat rhythms in your heart to beat and to pulsate for these things but isn't it good to sometimes just to look and explore god's word to just as a gentle reminder of what we need to do jesus gave this illustration about people should be taking the time to provide assistance. Jesus talks about in the gospel of Luke. He talks about a man who went to Damascus. And fell among thieves. And he was beaten and he was left for dead. I mean how tragic. And then maybe if he was conscious. And he sees somebody coming down there. He's going oh thank God somebody's going to. Somebody's going to. Isn't that the worst feeling in the pit of your stomach. If your car's broke down. And you see somebody drive by and they don't ever stop to help. They just, they just go on. Isn't that a horrible feeling? And I'm sure here's this guy. He's all battered. He's bruised. He's bleeding. And out of all the people to pass him up, one of, one of them is a priest. And he doesn't want to get his hands dirty. He doesn't want to be involved. Well, this guy probably done something against God's will and against God's word. So he probably got what he deserved. That's probably what he was thinking. And, and then there was a Levite 
who went by and he Bible says that he just he passed on the other side. Nope, I ain't got time. I I see that there's opportunity to do something, but I, I'm not going to provide assistance. Then the Bible says that there was a Samaritan who came by and saw what had happened. He saw that there was opportunity. He could be generous. He could be gracious. He could be good. All those combined together to make a tremendous difference. And when he comes to him, the Bible says that he, he took him and, and he dressed his wounds. He poured oil and wine as an antiseptic and got everything all clean, bandaged him up, put him on his beast of burden, took him to the nearest town, put him in a hotel, and paid for the hotel and said, listen, whatever this man needs to far to get back into recovery, I will pay what it takes. We need to encourage and we need to persuade so our heart can beat strong to provide assistance. It's my prayer as I encourage you for you to pray to say, where can I be of assistance? Point number three, our heart should beat to love God. The greatest commandment can be found in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Where it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love God. Our heart should beat to love God. How can, we, how, can we, how can we learn to love God? We can trust God more. We can worry less. Trust God more. Worry less. Would you guys do this? I want you to write down Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. You can go home and you can read it later. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. This is what worry does. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25. Worry weighs a person down. An encouraging word chairs a person up. So if you want to love God more, learn to trust Him more. You want to love God more? Radically be obedient. Did you know the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice? Point number four this morning. Our hearts should beat for seeking a place of contentment. Can I ask a personal question? Is your heart content? If, if it's not content, why is it? Why is your heart out of sync? Why is your heart beating out of rhythm? Why is your heart not content? At this moment in time. Let's examine. Let's examine some parts. About contentment. Number one. God wants us to be happy and content. God wants you. To be happy and content. God wants you. To be happy and content. God created you. He made you in his own image. And God wants you. To be happy and and content. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 13. A glad heart makes a happy face. If you're glad in your heart. When your heart beats. Man, you, it shows, it reflects. You have a happy face. But a broken heart. A broken heart crushes the spirit. <coughs> Secondly. We have to learn to be content. The natural process is to complain. We have to learn to be content. Have you ever met people, just no matter what, they're never happy? It's like, hey man, it's snowing, the snow is beautiful. I hate snow. Hey, man, it is gorgeous out there. The flowers are blooming. My allergies are killing me. Yeah, if you, if, can I get an amen? If you, if you guys know people like that, no matter what, they're just never happy. That's why we have to personally, we have to learn. It is a learned condition. Sometimes it's a lifelong process about being content. If you're not content, you need to find out why that you're not content. And you need to change the things that you can change 
and accept the things and know that God is working in your life. But wherever that, that you're at in your pathway and your process with God and your journey with the Lord, you need to learn to be content. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. The Apostle Paul writes, Now I speak in respect of want, for I have learned that whatsoever state I am, to be content. So whatever condition that I find myself in, I am content. And that is a learned process. We must learn to be content. Here's another one. You want to be content? Romance your wife. It says this in Proverbs chapter 5. Love your wife. Be a, let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. You need to romance your wife. You need to spend time. You need to be able to do that. Next week is Valentine's Day. Do, do something special. And don't let it just be just Valentine's Day, be the only day of the year that you show affection uh, for her and for your spouse. Do, do that throughout the rest of the year. Lastly is love your family and model contentment. You know what your, you know what your children, you know what your offspring are going to do if they see you grumpy and hateful and complain about everything? You know what they're going to do? They're going to do the same thing. They're going to see you complain, be grumpy, be hateful, and that is a learned behavior. Listen to this. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, it says, Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of the life that God has given you under the sun. The wife gives you... The wife God gives you is your reward for all your earthly toil. Whatever you do, do well. When you go to the grave, there will be no work or planning or knowledge or wisdom. Are you being content? Is your heart being seeking a place of contentment? There are so many people who are so miserable in life. They're not in the place of work that they, they want to be. Seek a place of contentment. They're not hanging out with the people that they want to be. You have the power to change that. You have, you have the power to change a lot of things. And we should be seeking God and God's presence and asking him to help us to be a people who are content and allow our hearts to beat for a place of contentment. We should be happy where we are at we should be happy with what God is doing in our life and know that God is not finished with us yet God is still continuing to work in our lives he's doing a deep work and he's going to continue to keep working and for the rest of this month I want to challenge you all to continue to keep praying that our hearts beat strong you ever known somebody who's got their heart out of rhythm you know, they're, they're still able to function. They're, they're still able to do the things that they need to do. They're still able to carry on a conversation with you. But I've, I've, I've seen people who we've had to bring them into the hospital and we've had to shock their heart. Why do we do that? We shock it to get it back in rhythm. The, the heart muscles aren't beating. So, sometimes they're beating against one another. or Sometimes they're not working as effectively as they could. What's your heart beating for today? What is, what's causing your heart to beat? Would you bow your heads with us? And we ask the worship team to come on up. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and your goodness to us. God, I want to pray that uh, we can be an encouragement and that our hearts have been spoken to. And Lord, if there's anyone here today whose hearts have been on the wrong things, whose heart's just not right with you, not beating as strong as what it needs to. God, I want to pray that you just draw those people to you. God, maybe we haven't been seeking the opportunities to serve and, and, and to be involved in work. God, maybe, maybe we've just not been generous. Maybe we've not been gracious. God, today, would you just 
allow us right for this time. Let time stand still. And Lord, we allow you to work on us. We love you. May the Spirit just move in a very special way here. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And amen. Let go and throw my future into